Hello, everyone. I'm Jesse Colin Jackson, the executive director of UCI's Beale Center for Art and Technology. And I'd like to welcome you to the first of four events in our speaker series this year focused on urgent conversations between art and ecology. Uh, at the end of my introduction, I'll put a link to the entire series in the chat, um, but I do hope you can join us again for conversations with Ian Ingram on February 23rd, Hans Bauman on March 9th, and for a panel event in April that will conclude the series. A reminder that Ian Ingram's exhibition remains open at the Beale through March 5th. And by the way, if you've never been to the Beale Center, this is it here behind me. Um, and we'll be having a closing reception on March 5th, 2 to 5 p.m. So I hope to see you there in real life. Before we, begin, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of California, Irvine is located on the ancestral and unceded shared territory of the Hahashimen and Tonva peoples, which extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. We are grateful to these original stewards of the land where we live, work, and study, who, despite the history of violence and racism, forced displacement, land theft, and colonialism, still hold strong cultural, spiritual, and physical ties to this region. Um, though we're on Zoom, we want this to be an interactive event. So please type any questions in the window provided and we'll, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, we wanna maximize our time for these questions. So I'm going to do some very important thank yous in advance. I'd like to thank our guest, Carolina Sacido and our moderator, Dr. Jessica Pratt for joining us. I'd like to thank UCI Illuminations, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts and the Beale Family Foundation for supporting this series. And I'd like to especially thank UCI Art MFA candidate, Margaret Oakley, who has been working tirelessly for over a year now to bring you these events. I'm gonna hand things off to Margaret now to introduce our moderator. Okay, um, thank you, Jesse, for really energizing this initiative and being so excellent to work with. Um, hi, everyone. It's such an honor to work on this series, which merges art and ecology, uh, two complex fields that offer such potent social value. I believe uh, interesting things can occur in the overlapping Venn diagram space between these fields. And when we reached out to Jessica Pratt, a uh, community ecologist and teaching faculty in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine. She not only said yes, but has been really helpful in promoting Carolina's artist lecture. And hopefully the people that end up um, being able to view this either live with us now or um, when it's posted to the UCI Illuminations YouTube afterwards. Um, we hope that the audience contains folks not only from the art department, uh, woo -woo art department, but also people from the other side of campus uh, in, the, in the sciences um, and off campus people who care about ecological and humanitarian issues. Uh, Dr. Jessica Pratt primarily teaches courses in the undergraduate minor in global sustainability and the master's in conservation and restoration science. Currently, she is conducting research to understand the emotional responses that students have to learning about the state of the environment. In particular, she is investigating feelings of eco grief or climate anxiety in students which refers to the psychological devastation that comes with observing day after day, the growing problems facing the planet. Through her research and teaching, she hopes to develop effective approaches to teaching about planetary crises while also instilling hope, emotional resilience, and a determined self-efficacy in students. Thank you for being here with us, Dr. Pratt, and moderating um, tonight's uh, lecture. And I will now hand off the imaginary uh, microphone to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. I am really excited to be here for this event this evening. And it's a privilege to introduce uh, Carolina to you all. Um, artist Carolina Casedo is a multidisciplinary artist who's become known for her performances, video, books, sculptures, and installations that examine environmental and social issues, particularly issues of justice. Her work contributes to the construction of environmental historical memory as a fundamental element for non-repetition of violence against humans and non-human entities. 
Her art is informed by indigenous philosophies and challenges us to understand nature as a living and spiritual entity that unites people and to consider how social and political resistance, solidarity and cultural and environmental biodiversity are intertwined. She has developed publicly engaged projects in major cities across the globe, and tonight will be telling us about her recent works that examine various relationships between humans and nature. Currently, Carolina is a U.S. Latinx Artist Fellow and a Borderlands Fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University. Welcome um, so much, Carolina. I'm excited to hear what you have to share tonight. Thank you, Jessica, and also thanks, Margaret, for putting all this together for giving the invitation and, and to everyone who is attending. So I can't see you, I can feel you. Um, so let me start sharing my screen. Uh, and uh, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing it, please? Good. So. I'm going to be focusing on a body of work that started around 2012. It's called Be Damned. And uh, of course, playing with the, with the uh, word we use to uh, describe the process of damming or containing a body of water. And also, you know, thinking about damming as a cursing, cursing something, right? Uh, and uh, as uh, Jessica was telling in the introduction, um, you know, it entails uh, pieces in different mediums, video, photography, uh, artist books, sculptures, performances. I'm going to be showing a little bit of everything. But this, this image is an image of a, uh, a mega dam that, uh, be, that was built on the Magdalena River, which is the most important river in Colombia, where I'm from, uh, a river uh, where I used to live as a teenager. And this is the second mega dam built on the Magdalena River as part of a master plan for development of the river. It started the construction around 2009 in terms of like the environmental um, permit, uh, uh, the concession of the river to a transnational company in Desainel, which is an Italian Spanish company. So this is a, an important dam in the history of Colombia because it's the first dam built by transnational capital in the country. And it's just 36 kilometers downstream for, from another dam called Betania, built in the late 80s. Uh, this master plan contemplates 17 large dams in the upper and middle part of the river. So far, two have been built. And then the, um, the, uh, the lower part, uh, you know, is intended to be dredged so boats uh, large-scale boats can, can come in like a, the hydro way, if you wish, uh, to, you know, to be loaded with coal, with oil, and with other minerals that are expected to be extracted. Uh, the, these are all hydroelectric dams, or, uh, but also multi-purpose dams. So water reservoir, uh, tourism, and, and, and hydroelectricity production. This dam is called El Quimbo. And I started visiting the site around 2012. Uh, so this is an image actually from a fisherfolk boat. Um, and I encountered a community uh, quite organized against the dam uh, in a, in association, a local association called Asokimbo, people of, uh, the Association of People Affected by El Kimbo Dam, who were doing a lot of direct action. Uh, in this case, for example, this, this banner is close in the entrance to one of the, um, the building sites of the dam itself. So they were blocking the construction for sometimes for 30 days at a time. They were um, filing legal actions. Uh, they were doing a lot of educational campaigns, uh, oops, uh, marches in the town too. These are small rural towns, but marching is also doing a lot of uh, outreach to the community uh, and demanding uh, a revision of the environmental license of the dam, uh, a revision of the initial census that only accounted for a few hundred of affected people, uh, and, and also educating other communities who were who are contemplated in the master plan to become aware that this 
kind of project was coming into their territory. A lot of these people had been affected from the Betania Dam uh, decades ago. So they knew that these promises of development of jobs uh, that, you know, the companies kind of bring along when they're building an infrastructure like this uh, were not really true. And there's, there was, this also coincided with a kind of uh, another awakening, if we wish, where we start understanding that hydroelectricity, you know, that, and that's kind of a, in, in the last two decades, that large hydroelectrics um, have been posed to us as clean energy um, and that the social environmental impact that they produce um, are worth it because of the energy they produce. But, uh, you know, we've started to learn through the years that these large scale dams, most of them built with concrete or earth filled dams, after 50 years, start to collect a lot of sediment, don't produce the same electricity. Uh, and that the, at the end, damming a river or an important, or, you know, a large or middle sized river brings, you know, consequences over the years, like extinction of species, both fish. And, uh, and vegetable species, um, the displacement of people, uh, the taking over very fertile land, uh, you know, along the riverbanks. So food sovereignty uh, becomes an issue. And so all these people were, you know, kind of debating and arguing these, these, uh, these things and continuing to resist uh, in different ways. But for me, what I found more interesting is that that resistant was embodied in everyday gestures, like continuing to fish right there in the dam construction. This is the spillway what that you see in the background. Um, and of course, you know, dams cut the flow of the river. And when you have anadromous fish uh, that, you know, go up the river to spawn, uh, that cycle is cut. Uh, they're cut right where the dam is being constructed. So for a certain time while the dam was being constructed right there besides the dam was the best place to fish. So a lot of people would go and fish there. They would continue to weave their nets or to wash gold on the river. And this is uh, artisanal gold mining. And I started understanding that uh, these, these everyday gestures that are really choreographies that are, uh, what I call embodied and accumulated knowledge, right? There's different kinds of knowledges. This, this setting is more an academic knowledge where we're transmitting, uh, you know, uh, knowledge in this institutional setting. But there's other kinds of knowledge that are inherited from our grandmothers, our mothers. Uh, they're mostly embodied knowledge. They have to do with processes of care, caring for animals, caring for children, caring for for uh, the food we're growing, uh, caring for the environment, or processes of sustenance and nurturing, cooking, healing, right? These are embodied knowledges. Or even going out to fish, washing gold, procuring a uh, family economy. Um, these everyday choreographies, as I call them, are intrinsic to a particular geography, in this case, the river, Magdalena, where I encountered them. And I started calling this everyday gestures, geo-choreographies, right? Choreographies, everyday choreographies that have to do with memory muscle that are sophisticated because of the continuous embodiment of the gesture through generations and that are totally tied into the geography of the river in this case. Uh, uh, like, you know, rowing your canoe, uh, carving your canoe, carving your, uh, sorry, your um your rowing tool. Um, and so I started seeing that eventually when an extractivist project of this dimension, such as hydroelectric dam, right? So I, I consider a dam an extractivist infrastructure, right? Because it's extracting basically energy from the river and is extracting people uh, uh, from the access to the water itself. But ultimately, what, it, what it's doing is that it's extracting these everyday gestures, these choreographies out of people. Because when you don't have access to the river as you know it, a flowing river, but instead you start uh, having a stagnant reservoir as your everyday, you stop fishing, you stop weaving that net, you stop washing gold, uh, you stop carving your tools and canoeing down the river. 
And so these embodied knowledges that have been transmitted for generations suddenly are cut, right? This transmission of knowledge is cut and eventually that knowledge is extracted from our bodies. So this is something that definitely worries me, uh, continues to you know, kind of alarm me into today. Also trying to understand how infrastructure operates in the human body. We always think about infrastructure as something that's outside and far and removed from us you know, at a human scale, but it, it's totally, you know, uh, in relation to us, to the point that it can extract our knowledge. And so um, it was really wonderful to see how, uh, you know, the folks were using their bodies as a political tool in these different, you know, uh, blockades, direct actions. And uh, as an artist, I thought that I could support that local agenda by, um reinforcing the use of the body as a political tool. So we started with the help of a local uh, activist group called Hagos por el Territorio to offer <clears throat> a series of um, workshops to the different towns that were affected by the, by the dam construction, from uh, muralism to uh, the use of audiovisual tools, social cartography, theater of the oppressed, um, uh, performance, oh, one second, there you go. Um, performance workshops. And uh, during, the, during the spawn of six months in 2014, we offered these um, workshops open to all ages. It was really interesting to see the different generations of the communities coming together. And then uh, during the workshops, there was also a goal of, um, producing a series of actions towards the end of our, you know, of our time together, of our sharing, uh, to kind of leave a living message on, on the river, uh, bring communities together, and kind of think about different direct actions that didn't, in, that didn't provoke direct confrontation with riot police, right, also. So thinking how to occupy public space with a very clear message uh, without being confrontational. And people came with very different ideas from a community who was <clears throat> not exactly on, uh, on the riverside, but kind of up in the canyon in the mountain, wanted to bring the river into their um, hamlet. So they devised this long uh, kind of blue fabric to represent the river and bring it across the town. Um, also just like bringing all the town down to the river itself and painting messages on the river stones. Uh, or this one that, that was quite interesting, that was a, uh, a kind of a farewell to the, to, the, uh, to the bridge that was gonna be covered and that is now covered by the reserver. Here in the back, you can see actually um, the, the pillars of the, new, uh, of the new bridge that now exists and all this is covered with water. And, and here we are with a, with, you know, with, a, with a banner we painted that says water for life, not for death. We had hang little lamps on, on, the, on the bridge. And it's really interesting to think about this image uh, about uh, uh, um, in regards to environmental historical memory, right? And that's something that Jessica mentioned at the beginning and thinking about how artists, like the skills we have as artists is to create images and to deconstruct them too, you know, to deconstruct oppressive images and to construct counter images. Uh, but you know, with those skills, we can definitely support processes of environmental, of the construction of environmental historical memory. And I think about this image as a good example of that, of you know, an image that is clearly showing how the place looked to, you know, used to, to be, how the river used to flow, where the body of the river used to cross, uh, an everyday kind of commute uh, that was deeply part of the kind of culture of those two communities connected by this bridge uh, to the extent that they wanted to say goodbye. Uh, and so if we compare this image to, you know, to an image of how the place looks today, right, at least it gives us uh, a memory of how it used to look. And if we think about processes of the dam dismantling, at least we have a reference of how you know, the river could, could probably look again or become again. Uh, environmental historical memory also um, 
helps us recognize different kinds of violences. Uh, and I'm interested in, in maybe touching base with Jessica after about this idea of echo grief, uh, because that's definitely something that environmental historical memory kind of builds up, upon. Um, and these are other examples of, of the different kind of uh, community gather, gatherings and events that we recreated together. One of, one of the things that we used to do a lot was to write with our bodies living messages on the riverbank as a way to claim that territory uh, as part of the community and also to kind of counteract this rhetoric that is a very colonial one where, you know, uh, a mine, a dam, or an oil field are plopped and planned into the territory of a certain community with the excuse that there's nothing there. There's just wilderness, wilderness. Nothing is happening there, right? So we, we have all the right to come and plop this progress project in this location. So for us, it was important to assert our presence in these locations uh, where all these dams are being planned. And of course, cooking as an important meeting point for the community. And that's something I learned from actually establishing relationships with the community, right? Cooking as a way to break ice, but also as a way to find common commonalities and, uh, and, and for everyone to bring something into the pot. So there's something coming out of the pot for everyone. Mm, this, another example of environmental historical memory, this all this tropical forest is gone and covered by water uh, today, unfortunately. And so um, as part of these events, we were also using the, the local and everyday tools such as the cast net to build this kind of uh, collective uh, powered puppets, if you wish. Uh, and, and this is actually a crying Mohan. So a Mohan is a folk figure from the river. It's the spirit that inhabits the depths of the river and that seduces women that go to wash their clothes along the river. It has this long hair and very long kind of mustaches and, and facial hair. And, and this Mohan is crying because it's displaced, right? So we were thinking of how to also um, give the message that displacement doesn't only happen to like living entities, if you think like human species or animal species, or, you know, when you build a dam and you fill it, you actually cut all the organic matter. So there's also an erasure of the biocultural diversity of the forest. Uh, but also even the folk tales get displaced, right? Because if there's no river to inhabit, but instead this big reservoir, the folk tales disappear, right? So also thinking about how um, ecocide and epistemicide go hand in hand. So the fishing net has been a, a, an element that has been very important in my practice. Uh, I, you know, I first encountered and first went fishing with a cast net in a river with, with uh, the people from La Hagua, this community that, where I, I stayed and from where we operated all these workshops. And, and you know, I was fascinated by the technology of the fishing net because it entails the, the knowledge of weaving right? It entails the knowledge of fishing, of, you know, of knowing the river very well, where the fish dwell, where they like to rest. Uh, also the cycles of the, of the spawning of the different fish species, the currents of the river, but it also stands for food sovereignty, economic autonomy. Uh, and so I started, um, as you saw, the first time we used the fishing net was to build this collective puppet. puppet. But then I started thinking about the, the fishing net as a symbol of how our society could work better, right? The fishing net is this man-made or human-made, human-scale object that's porous, malleable, that captures the sustenance but lets the water flow, um, <clears throat> that when it breaks and it, you know, it, sometimes it's torn by a, by a rock or by a, uh, or by a, a or by a wooden piece in the river, it doesn't um, compromise the functioning of the whole structure, it can be repaired, right? So how beautiful our society would work 
if it worked like a fishing net, that it could be repaired when it's torn, that it's porous, that it's adaptable to the currents, that it's malleable, that captures the sustenance. But instead, it seems to work more like a dam, right? Like this corporate made, monumental structure that cuts the flow of the river in two, that cuts the communities connected by this river, cuts them apart, severs those connections, um, that breaks up cycles of reproduction within the ecosystem that's uh, you know, impermeable, like non-trespassable. Um, so I, I started uh, working with the fishing net and, and generated a, a few pieces with fishing nets. One, the first one actually was this performance called Atarraya in Spanish. These kind of cast nets are called Atarraya. Uh, which is really beautiful because if you decompose the, the, the word, it, it's atar raya, to tie a line. And it's actually the way you weave it. It's just a, a concept, like a, a sequence of knots. Um, and uh, the atar raya uh, is a script where there's an orator actually telling you all this, what I've been telling you about the fishing net, what it stands for, how it's weaved, who weaved this atar raya in particular, how long it took, what kind of atar raya, it is uh, because you have different kind of uh, measurements of the holes. You have smaller holes for smaller fish, bigger holes for bigger fish. And then at the end, um, and while this or orator is telling all this information, an actual fisher folk is throwing the net into this empty space. And you hear, so the net also has on the sides, it has these, um, these weights. So you hear the weight kind of crashing against the floor and then at the end, we invite the public to actually stand up and hold the net and conform this collective body, right? And the conformation of the collective body is something that I'm really interested uh, in. And I think that also, uh, you know, through, the, through arts and through different art making and, and different cultural practices, we can conform collective bodies, bodies of solidarity, bodies of resistance, uh, bodies of biocultural diversity. And so at the end, we, we invite the people to stand up and to hold the net and to kind of continue weaving the net with their arms. So we ask them to kind of cross their arms together as if they were part of the net. And then we take this photo from above, right? This, this picture from above. And you've seen, you've seen that we've been showing a lot of images from the senatal view, right? When we were right in from our bodies, is taken a picture from above. Uh, and then this picture becomes kind of a, a copyright-free uh, image that can be used and you know it for a poster or for it you know it starts distributed it gets distributed through social media immediately and it starts circulating and it's uh, really interesting to learn that uh, different communities have kind of reappropriated the performance and have uh, understood the potential of the performance to actually bring their stories and their cases into instances of decision making uh, for example, uh, in Colombia, we signed the peace process with the FARC guerrilla a number of years ago. And within the framework of these peace process, a truth commission was established where perpetrators of violence, as well as communities and victims and survivors, get together to acknowledge what happened, to learn the truth of what, what happened, and to come up with uh, protocols for reparations, right? And so as part of this environmental, uh, environmentally conscious groups of victims and survivors started pushing the idea that in Colombia, uh, nature not only has been a scenario of the war, but also a victim of the war, right? Uh, when, you know, when because of war tactics, an pipe, oil pipeline gets blown, and there's, uh, you know, an old oil spilling that contaminates a river that makes that river a victim of the war. Um, but also to acknowledge that through different infrastructural projects and mining projects and extractivist projects, there has been displacement of population in Colombia, not only by armed conflict, but also by the construction of, of uh, different infrastructures and uh, extractivist projects. So all these claims were posed to these different institutions in different ways. And at the Raya, the performance, the script was used by communities affected by dams in Colombia to actually uh, 
demand that a, a line of investigation was opened where we could see where it, armed conflict and environmental conflict in Colombia touched uh, each other and where they overlapped. So the fishing net also, by bringing some fishing nets, of course, I've been fascinated with them. I've, I've got my hands on a few of them, brought them into the studio and, and started experimenting more formally and sculpturally with them. And the result is a series called the Cosmo Atarrayas, yeah, Cosmos and Atarraya. It's the mix of the two words. Uh, understanding that these atarrayas, these fishing nets, are universes in their own, you know, hold these universes of, of knowledge, hold these, you know, lives of the people who, who fish with them and who make them. And, and, and then um, I, I think about the cosmatarrayas as visual spells, if you wish, right? And they all have their own kind of personality and talk about different things. This yellow one, for example, is a is kind of dedicated to Oshun, which is the Joruba deity for fresh waters. She always has a, a golden mirror glass and she allows for fisher folk to have a good fishing session and for artisanal miners to, to gather gold. Um, others are speaking more about particular issues such as contaminated water, like this one um, or this one call uh, to drive away whiteness. And so uh, this is, uh, the fishing nets are circular by technology and by design. What I do is add a kind of uh, metal structure to open them in different shapes and color them, and then kind of customize them as, if you wish uh, with these ideas, you know, to, to bring along different ideas in this case. Uh, you know, talking about the different waters that feed Los Angeles, where I live today. So this, these containers have water from the Pacific Ocean, from the Colorado River, and from the Los Angeles River. And this is just a view of that uh, Oshun piece that I was talking uh, about. So that view from above that I was talking at a certain point, um, remember I show you images of the phrases Ridden with the vis with the bodies, and that and that view from above, that you know that uh, the decision of taking that photograph from a drone perspective is a decision also to hack that view from above, right? If you think about the different perspectives you have a t over a territory, and when I say territory, I refer to it more in how we use it in Latin America, and it's to refer to the piece of land where you're from, that it, of course includes the waterways, the forests the mountains in that piece of land, um, but that also entails all the different relationships that happen within that ecosystem. So the, you know, the biological relations, the spiritual relations, the political, economical, social, cultural relations that happen in that ecosystem. And so, you know, you have different perspectives over a territory. You have the view from above, like this one, which is a satellite photograph taken of El Quimbo Dam in construction which is the view from power, right? Just that drone militaristic view uh, that kind of erases biocultural diversity. I mean, you can see there's trees here, but the individuality or the species of the tree, you cannot see. You can see constructions where humans, this, this is the man camp of the dam, but you cannot see the human. You can certainly not see the different fish in the river. So it's this view from above that erases biocultural diversity. You have also the view of the person who is on the ground, and that would be the view of the person, for example, throwing the net. Remember that first image of the person throwing the net right in front of the dam? That would be the person on the people on the ground. But you have other non-human perspectives, right? And if we're talking about environmentalism, I think it's important to acknowledge that there's non-human perspectives in the territory, and that would be the perspective of a fish, for example, underwater, or even the perspective of a rock that has been millenary turned on the riverbed for eons and ages, right? Those are perspectives to be acknowledged too. And so this, this idea of hacking the view from above informed this group of works that are made with satellite imagery. Uh, satellite imagery, in this case, uh, this piece is called Agente Rio and puts in, in the same panel, satellite imagery from, from uh, three different dams across the Brazilian territory. Uh, the, 
este, Itaipuda, which is the third largest dam in the world. It's a binational dam between Paraguay and, and Brazil over the Paraná River. Uh, the Belo Monte Dam, which is the second largest dam in the world, in Brazil too, on the Xingu River and the Amazon Basin. And then uh, the breaking of a mine tailing dam. So also this is the first time I start looking at dams, not only as uh, hydroelectricity structures, but also structures that hold rubbish, toxic mud, mine tailing uh, produce. And then putting them together to actually not clarify anything, but actually complexify the lecture of these different structures, right? So try to also subvert the initial um, use of this cartographic images or satellite imagery, which is to clarify something and to show and to kind of show the, the, the territory as it is. But I believe there's things that are unmappable, right? There's things that are non-measurable within a territory. And so the idea of overlapping and mashing up these images is actually to present a much more complex histories of these locations. But also in this case particular, to put three different dams of three different historical moments in Brazil as part of the same authoritarian and, and we could even argue um, dictatorial mining energetic model that exists across the Americas. In the case of Brazil, the Itaipu Dam that was built during the dictatorship in the 80s, um, you know, and the way that dam was built is not different of how those mine tailing dams in Minas Gerais, in the state of Minas Gerais, that is completely a sacrifice zone today, or the Belo Monte Dam built under the socialist government of Dilma Rousseff had the same dictatorial model of how they were constructed. There was no consultation with the communities and the dam was imposed, uh, you know, in their territory. Um, this is an image uh, also showing uh, other, other works in this vein, but also opening up to, to these other series uh, called the water portraits. Let me see what continues here. Yes, the water portraits. So um, it's interesting because they're, though, though they're very different series and these are images from above, uh, you know, from this, trying to hack this perspective from above. These are actually um, images that are in a series called, that I call the water portraits that are um, portraits that I take of bodies of water. And I decided that the, the format of portrait was, uh, was something I want to pursue when representing, or more than representing, we're showing or sharing, let's say, the body of water that I wanted to portray. Um, kind of in, a, in an attempt to unlearn landscape as a given format, right? So as art makers, we have like two main formats, the landscape format, which is the horizontal format, which has been used historically to represent nature, right? But if you think about that, about it, you know, we artists have been complicit in colonial processes through formatting nature uh, in landscape processes. Because if you think about it, landscape is a window through which we look at nature, right? But as observers through this window, we place ourselves outside of nature, right? When the truth is that we're never outside of nature, we have never been outside of nature, we're not at the center of it either, as Anthropocene wants to make us believe, we're part of the whole set of relationships that exist in an ecosystem, right? So. You know, if you if you think about different uh, lines of landscaping, you know, through gardening, through the design of of you know of places, uh, but also through paintings, through video, through you know any representation of nature that you think, we can argue that artists and you know and art and art making has been complicit with the colonial gaze, right? And so, as artists who as an artist who's like undergoing a process of decolonization and trying to work on these things, I understood that I couldn't use landscape to represent or to, you know, to portray these bodies of water, but that instead, you know, these bodies of water actually are like me. They're political subjects with the agency to change the course of events. And so that portraying was a much more useful tool for me. 
And this idea also came from a very particular moment. And it's this, this is a, a still from a film called uh, a Land of Friends. And it's uh, accessible through my, through my channels. And <clears throat> it comes from a very, you know, the inspiration to turn the river upside down came from a conversation I had with uh, a fisherwoman uh, affected by El Kimbodan, Soila. And she would say, oh, when I go out and protest, I carry the Colombian flag upside down, uh, you know, to, to say that I'm not in accordance to, our, to what our governance is doing, to our administration. You know, they're supposed to administer our common goods, our rivers, not to sell it away or to treat them as resources for somebody to come and exploit. So when I was editing the film, I thought, oh, I, I want to I also be in resistance and I'm going to turn and flip you know, she was flipping the, the Colombian flag. I'm going to flip the image of the river. And when I flipped it up, you know, it, it really opened a set of cinematic language possibilities, but also made me think, oh, like <laughs> a river that flows upwards can never be dammed the way we know damming, right? So it, it opened up this kind of theoretical and, and, and kind of visual language lines that I could keep exploring. And one of them was you know, it took me to this idea of the water portraits and portraying as a much more useful tool. These are series, the series of the water portraits. So they, they're printed on these long fabrics. Uh, I always thought that I wanted to use fabric as a substrate in order to be able to bring the water portraits into the river again at some point. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, some of uh, uh, the last... The la like the most the most recent ones I've done of the series. This is actually a water portrait of the Santa Ana River here on unceded Hashem and Tongva territory. So it has also become a way for me to establish and deepen the connections with the rivers that are actually sustaining me while I'm you know I'm a visitor in this land and I'm healing in this land. And and here is more an image of of the activation of the water portraits. Uh, and this is in the mouth of the Wanauna River or the Santa Ana River in in Orange County. And also, again, you know, this idea of conforming the collective body through gesture was an important one in, in kind of uh, developing this language of, along with the choreographers and dancers who helped me in this piece. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up with this last, uh, this last uh, um, skip in, or maybe, um, to show this images of the Serpent River book, which is an artist book that compiles um, visual and written information from all this field work that I've been doing uh, for the last decade. Um, you know, it also puts together different perspectives of different moments, of, like of a single moment as, as the breaking of this uh, mind tailing dam in, in Minas Gerais in Brazil. Like you can see how uh, the actual embroidery of a person who survived uh, the the toxic mud coming down the river in her town, you know, contrasted with the the actually satellite imagery of the same event, and and this river book, uh, as many of my pieces, I, I like to think them as open ended pieces. I, I'm not interested in making artwork that. Once it's finished, it closes it itself. But I want to make artwork that actually allows for interaction and allows for it to actually kind of exploit into different lines of possibilities and that has different points of entry too. And so the river book is designed in a way that it's this long meandering concertina fold that can be read, that can be installed in more sculptural ways, but that can be activated too and used as community workshop tools um, etc. I wanted to finish with, uh, with this piece also, uh, um, which is uh, a, a part of a series called Genealogy of Struggle. Uh, and this is a, a, a mural painted directly on the wall. This is a literation made last year in El Museo del Barrio in New York. And it's a uh, following kind of a ceiba tree, which is a, a tree with very big um, roots from Latin America very common in Colombia and Puerto Rico, places where I lived. And the names that you see are actually names of killed environmentalists, assassinated, murder environmentalists across the world. So you have the name of the person, like this one, Tomás Rojo Valencia, Mexico, the country where the person was murdered and the year, 2021. Um, 
This, this particular tree has the name of over 400 environmentalists killed in 2020 and 2021 alone. Each year, the number of killed environmentalists across the world grows and grows. The countries where those killings happen continue to be the same, being Colombia, Mexico, Philippines, always in the three, three first places. And, uh, and for me, that's something that uh, a lot of the time when we talk about climate crisis is ignored. So we focus on statistics of, uh, of ocean warming, of ice cap melting, uh, extinction of different species, the fires, of course, here in California or in the Pacific, in the Pacific coast. But the killing of environmentalists go hand in hand with these violence against Earth, you know, too. Or, or these violences that, you know, are the product of extractive policies and extractive projects and, you know, carbon emissions and whatnot. And, of course, you know, to learn about where these killings are happening, right, the trees, you know, wants to serve as a kind of cartographic map also of where these killings are happening, allows us to identify also where these front lines of environmental injustice are, actually. And so... And for me, it was important to also open a space for the community to acknowledge these ancestors, you know, in struggle uh, and to acknowledge, uh, you know, those particular struggles. So we, we, can, we gather testimonies from different parts of Latin America, actually from Mexico, from Colombia, from Guatemala and from Philippines, which are the countries with, mo with most killings. And we read them during this day and we asked the community to bring uh, compostable offerings for the altar. So we built this altar in public space and, you know, lighted all these lights at sunset and had this beautiful offering. And now this compost, or all these offerings are actually composting now at this moment in a community garden in East Harlem called El Sitio Feliz, where in May, in a couple of months, we're going to plant a memorial tree right here. Uh, using, you know, the compost, the resulting compost to feed uh, the land. We're going to plant a shad bush, which is a native tree from, from the New York area, from the Lenape territory, that gives these berries that can be edible. And, and I really like to think this, this memorial tree as, as the beginning of a long-term relationship with this community garden, but also as something that I'm, that is, that I'm you know, kind of, in a way, uh, balances out kind of the ecological and carbon footprint that my work is producing and, you know, that as an artist I'm producing and has, has grounded me into thinking what are the ways that I need to account for my carbon footprint, uh, for the carbon footprint of my art working and what are the ways of that ecological balancing that I, you know, what are the ways that I can, that I can balance that uh, that is not, not a in a corporate way. I'm not interested in, car in buying carbon credits or in buying red R E D D, you know, or investing in anything of that. But actually, investing in maybe community gardens or uh, processes of land back, for example, uh, or processes of land stewardship, uh, you know, led by indigenous and 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 um, and peasant people uh, here in, you know, in California or in other parts of the Americas where I conduct field work and work. So I'm gonna wrap it here, open it for questions. Wonderful, uh, thank you so much, Carolina, for sharing this, this beautiful body of work. And I think there's, there's a lot of, of food for thought in the way that the ecologies that we might think about in the sciences are represented in, in the work that you do. So um, for the audience, if there are any questions, you can post them in the, the open Q&A and I can moderate that. And I'd like to just kick us off with a question, thinking about the communities that you interact with when you are doing your field work and the research for these projects. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of how they perceive the, the outcome of, of your art, in particular uh, when they have the opportunity to engage with the eventual installations that come from this work and what kind of, of feedback you have from the, the communities on how um, 
your art sort of represents what is happening there or even is is really a a healing kind of um, experience for them to participate in? Well, it doesn't, it's, you know, it's difficult that it happens all the time that it can actually have access to the museums because museums tend to be very centralized and a lot of the communities I work with are actually in more rural areas. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first issue that art continues to be an elitist and centralized institution, if you wish. And that's why we've also decided to do a lot of community on site with the people, right? Like the, like the, the vigils or the actions in, in the actual river bank, right? And so that kind of brings my practice into, into kind of two parallel bodies of work. One that it's done with the community for the community in the territories of the community and that don't have really a translation into the white cube. And I'm not interested in, you know, in translating to, into the white cube because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, I can share them in, in cases like this, that selection, I share images, but you will never see an image of, you know, of those bodies writing this word on the riverbank framed in an art gallery. There's, I don't have any interest in doing that. And then there's this kind of studio practice that stems out of those collaborations where these more formal and institutional kind of practice develops. Um, I do share, like we, of course, these communications occur a lot by WhatsApp and kind of these telegram and these kind of telephonic media. So I do share with the community and they're always very excited or when there's news uh, outlets that, you know, review the work, we share it. Uh, and they, they feel very excited that, um, you know, their stories are being heard and are being acknowledged. Uh, but I think what has, has been more powerful is, is when the connection between different communities going through the same thing kind of meet. So also for them, for example, in the book, to see themselves along with other communities going through similar issues has, has been very powerful in terms of connecting struggles um, you know, in different locations of the Americas. And I think that's, that's uh, for me, one of the most precious things that have happened through the work is to be able to enable these connections or sometimes more than enable them, strengthen them, strengthen them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely a, um, you know, I think about, I think about my art as something that gives them strength. For sure, like, and I think in terms of sustenance, right? And sometimes more in sustenance than that in terms of sustainability, which is a word I'm very wary of. I prefer to think of sustenance as something that nurtures, that gives life. So definitely uh, participating in these processes and, and, and having these kind of tension does nurture them in different ways. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have a question from Akari Kumura who says, I'm a composer and vocalist, and I'm also interested in nature embodiment and fostering ecological connection through my practice. And they're interested in your participatory works that invite communities of people to actively engage with your artwork. And specifically, what is your approach to inviting people into that participatory experience in a way that's welcoming and open and inclusive? So there's different, there's different, like it really depends of which the context, right? So when I'm working with a community on a front line of some environmental issue, I'm the one asking permission <laughs> to go and actually and, and kind of approach them. So that, that's actually, um, you know, kind of being very uh, sensible to what is the agenda in place, what is the need of the community in place, and then responding to those needs more than as an artist arriving as in a helicopter artist that we call them with a particular set idea and aesthetic goals and saying, this is the project I want to do and this is what we're going to do. That never works. That always messes things up. I think the best way to when you are interested in working with a certain issue and a community who is impacted by that issue is first asking permission and then really trying to understand what is the agenda and the needs in place and seeing what from your skills you can bring to that agenda and to support those agendas in, in place. Um, and then when, when it's in a more institutional setting um, uh, and there's this kind of um, 
activations of, of other pieces of sculpture, pieces of work, what I find that's been more useful to me is to collaborate continually with a, with a specific group of people, in this case, the people who have activated the water portraits, the river book, the fishing nets were different kind of performance for the camera or more performatic installations has been to, to find that connection, in this case, with a choreographer called Marina Magallanes, who lives here in, in LA, and to a, a smaller troupe of dancers who collaborate with her too, and to develop over time a language, an embodied language with her, and you know, kind of fostering that, that collaboration and keeping true to that collaboration. And when it's something that is open to the community, like a community sharing, for example, the vigil, uh, so, you know, building avenues for inclusivity. Uh, so, you know, in my case, that there's a bilingual access, you know, as a Spanish speaker, uh, um, making sure that also the local indigenous communities are invited or feel accepted. Um, also, just making a small gesture so that people really feel that they are participating. For example, asking people to bring a compostable offering into the altar already that's kind of an entry point allowing people to feel that they're being part of this and not just mere audience or mere spectators right so sometimes very small gestures or opening you know um a participation even as small as bringing you know a flower or a fruit or even just compost from your kitchen works yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. And I think that opportunity to, to participate in a variety of ways um, touches on this topic of, of eco grief that, that you mentioned and which I'm very interested in and, and really thinking about how do we heal that grief and a lot of the suggestions involve meaningful action and we can have grief about losses that have already occurred but also anticipatory grief about environmental and cultural losses that are that are coming in in the future and i think much of that that grief in the in the cases that you're talking about are really coming from the sense of being so connected to a place and knowing the history and the story and the, the knowledge that's encompassed in living um, in a really place-based life with, with nature. And so there's, there's that idea of knowing a, a place well and seeing the trajectory that it's on that, that kind of ties into that, that grief. And I think one, um, one question that kind of emerges from that is, is what we can do to create more of that sense of, of place where we live and particularly thinking about um, in LA and the LA suburbs, how do we enhance this, this connection to the places that we, we inhabit? Because if we don't have an emotional response to, to what's happening in the environment around us, we're not often called to, to action on its behalf. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's why for me has been important to, you know, to start developing you know, and to know him better, the rivers that sustain this territory, um, to, but it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy because what you say, though, there's a lot of disconnection. Um, I've been starting to look uh, more closely to, to the, also the plants that nurture me that are local too. And, uh, and to engage also, I think one of the what one of the very simple things to do is to really be aware of the you know kind of environmental justice uh, processes going close you know around us, right? So um, I'm pretty aware of um, what's going on with the big port of Long Beach, right, and uh, the kind of heavy traffic that those neighborhoods close also to the airport, right? Understanding that part of the city as a sacrifice zone in itself, right? All that area of Long Beach with the airport close by, the contamination of the trucks coming in and out of the port, whatnot. Uh, and there's a strong environmental resistance going on there. When I was living in Boyle Heights a few years ago, also uh, the lead factory that was dismantling, you know, and recycling lead that uh, you know, allowed for a big spillage, but also, you know, seeing the genealogies of struggle and resistance going on here. We have huge examples like the mothers of East LA, 
right here in East LA where I'm at the moment. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's some homework to do for sure, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, one more question. Um, Margaret, who is one of the organizers here tonight, uh, given the amount of, of research that you've engaged with um, regarding dams in particular, can you speak to some imagined futures of, of undamming or ways of, of altering these places to better accommodate human and non-human communities? Definitely. And that's a, um, a something I'm focusing on the next few years, which are uh, kind of issues of fair energy transition, right? So as, as the phrase says, it, fair energy transition is a transition. It's not going to happen immediately. And I think as artists and cultural workers, we have, a, we have a strong responsibility in actually helping to change the switch, that this is actually possible, that these futures that are undamned futures uh, futures where electricity uh, grids managed by and for the community exist are possible, right? Uh, and so I've been focusing on on different processes of transition across the Americas and trying to weave them uh, towards something, you know, that, that hopefully I can share in a few years. But looking at processes of undamming uh, rivers like the Elwa River and in Washington State, uh, the Klamath River that's going to be undammed in the next two years here in Northern California, and the Snake River that has four dams and there's a political momentum. So understanding that also a fair energy transition does not implicate just the product, other different ways or new ways of producing electricity, but it, it implicates degrowth too. It implicates the dismantling of existing infrastructure, such as the dismantling and decommissioning of dams. It implicates also processes of conservation, actually, too. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we don't make this relationship between trans transition and conservation, but actually uh, conservation of places that are uh, carbon sinks, for example, is an important issue of energy, trans like an important aspect of energy transition. Uh, and then I've been looking also at um, processes that are happening in Puerto Rico, for example, as a, as a country that's, uh, you know, a, a colo colonial, colonial territory of the United States, but also on that front line of climate change to all the, you know, increased hurricane activity that's happening in the island. Uh, and what are the local processes that are being uh, proposed by communities there? Trying to weave all these different kind of conservation climate in like uh, like uh, energy sovereignty dam decommissioning and smaller scale you know from biodigesters to very small solar grids in different parts of the americas trying to weave together as as a way to show that this is happening already this transition is happening and it's not going to happen at a large scale uh because then you know, we would be falling into kind of the modernity trap. The solutions are going to be very different. The solutions for California are going to be very different from the solutions of Puerto Rico. Yes, absolutely. And I love that analogy of, of weaving because, in, in fact, it is all connected, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. So, I hate that my appearance means that we're out of time for tonight. Um, I wanted to wrap up with one final thought, which is something I've learned from Jessica and her colleagues in um, ecology and evolutionary biology is this idea of ecological literacy and how we become detached from having any sense for what the land around us, even, you know, what, what's even there. We can't see it. We can't read it like a text, like we would have historically, or like, you know, people all over the world would have historically. And I think the work that, you know, both, both happening in ecology and the work like that Carolina is doing is part of this process of bringing this ecological literacy back into our world from two different directions that are kind of meeting in the middle um, here in this series. Um, so I'd like to once again, thank Margaret, Jessica and Carolina for this event. And thank you all for joining us tonight and your questions. And I'm sorry, we didn't get to every question. Um, and I invite you to join us again with Ian Ingram next week, same time. Um, and apologies to anybody who wasn't able to get into the the talk right away. Um, we'll fix that next week so that it's open if you didn't register. That's just a minor thing. So thank you everybody again. Um, good night.